Hello and welcome to Crazy Hank TV. We're continuing our lost rewatch, the greatest rewatch in the history of rewatches. And I'm joined by Ryan and Jen from the transmission. Hi. How's it going, guys? Aloha from the island. <laughs> good to see you, Jack. I mean, really good to see you. Yeah, it's, it's been, it's, well, it's been, uh, well, we did talk a few months ago, but I didn't see you, right? Right, right. Yeah, I think Jay, did Jay see you? <laughs> no, I, 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 we just just audio chats. Is oh, it's just audio. I don't know how because Jay never showed me the computer. He kept it, you know, whatever secret of whatever he was doing. So I just, you know, well, we were I'm talking all, about you. All good things. Yeah, uh, that's probably I'm probably probably right. Well, probably all bad things. But uh, anyway, uh, what we've been doing this rewatch, and we're we're moving on from. Uh, um, uh, Forgot the last two we did. So I'm watching all these out of order. Uh, we're going to talk about White Rabbit and House of the Rising Sun. But before we do that, how did you guys get into Lost? Well, uh, we live on the island, and yeah. Lost was a was a force in our lives before it aired. <laughs> so, oh, there's the street is closed. Oh, there's a plane wreckage on the North Shore. Yeah, what the heck is going there on? There were rumors about what was going on um, for a few months before the, sh the series started to air. Um, and there were there was rumors about um, what everybody saw at Comic-Con as far as the trailer. Um, so it was kind of something that was really all rumors until the, uh, until the premiere. Now, the interesting thing was there were recording t three TV shows in Honolulu at that exact same time. And again, nobody knew if any of them were gonna make it, they were all Oh, they're all pilots. One was like, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, and no, they, they were all um, greenlit. They all had a first oh, season. Okay. Um, one was North Shore, kind of a soap opera about a hotel. Uh, I, I do remember that was Bo Derek, right? I might have been. Was, was she in it? I can't remember. I, th I, I thought she, I thought she was in a Hawaiian show, but anyway. Well, the show did not survive. The second one, I can't Jason even remember Momoa what was it was. It. Jason Momoa. Um, oh, okay. And Lost. Okay. So you know. It's what I loved is the fact that we had no idea what was about to hit because it was just another TV show filming here, you know. Um, although I worked in downtown, I distinctly remember seeing them setting up a set. I walked onto the set. I I talked to people who were sitting around for a, during their lunch break. I was like, "Oh, this is going to be a police station. That's pretty cool." Like, there was no security. Nobody. Again, it hadn't become a hit. It was enough. It right. was an unknown. So it was just a novelty at that. This is before you had your want a wanted picture on the uh, set, so don't let this guy on the set. <laughs> yep, absolutely true. Uh, and I finally, I always heard that story. Someone finally sent me a picture of it, so uh, I know it actually existed. It was pretty cool. I was the most wanted <laughs> from the production. That that is pretty. I never asked you. Did you try disguises or anything like that to try and get on the set? No, no, no. They knew who I was. I knew who they were. Um, I knew them. It was, I would say it was largely a playful antagonistic relationship, although in yeah. some cases they were dead serious. So you never knew. <laughs> yeah. So did you start watching it from the start, the first first night? Now, I wish I could say that I went down to the premiere on the beach, because apparently that was the official mind-blowing public moment for the show. But no, right. I waited until it came on TV. Yeah, we had a new baby at the time. So... Yeah. Watching TV was um, something that was hit or miss for us. Um, we, I, I wasn't really interested in it because I had invested too much time in shows that ended up being canceled. So I was a yeah. little bit wary to get into something. And plus, you know, we didn't know how the baby, if, if he was going to sleep through it or if we were going to end up having to get up. And But he, he slept through the whole thing. Our um, friend uh, Mitchell went to the uh, – debut on the beach, sunset on the beach, and he actually, on our message board I ran, uh, message boards, old internet, um, <laughs> said, hey, you guys really, I mean, I'm not kidding, no fooling, this is a show you guys should pay attention to, so we made sure to watch them. Now, what made you decide to podcast about it? Because podcasting well, was, like I said, at this point, I had never heard of a podcast. So what made you decide, I got a podcast, we got a podcast about Lost? So the, the original podcast I was doing was just playing around talking about Hawaii. Right. Um, I remember and, that. Uh, my plan to introduce my wife to this concept was a segment called Annoy the Wife, which was just <laughs> sort of bring a microphone on her and just talk to her. Um, but she was fairly uh, 
uh, actually interested. So we would sit down and just have conversations like, oh, you know, what happened this week in Hawaii? And let's talk about our favorite beaches or books or things mm -hmm. like that. Um, and then as part of those stories, I would say, oh, yeah, and I saw Lost downtown and uh, they were they closed the a street and it's going to be a bank and you know normally a restaurant so that's going to be cool um, and it turned out that we developed a dual audience to our podcast people who would say i'm not interested in your personal lives or hawaii politics but talk more about lost and people who were watch listening for the hawaii thing saying i'm not even watching that tv show stop talking about it or talk about another tv show or something so i said well can't, you can't well, please everybody right Oh, that's always true in any media creation, and uh, I'm sure you are familiar with that. So we split off the Lost Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so we split off the Lost Podcast, and the rest is history. It just went bananas. Yeah, and we were lucky enough to debut at the time when podcasts started um, being featured on um, on iTunes. Right. Yeah. Our 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 number one success was Dumb Luck, which is we launched right before Apple said two things. Apple, uh, Steve Jobs got on stage and said, as of this next release, you can get podcasts in iTunes. And that was a big deal because before you had to have a variety of weird hacks and system extensions and things to get a podcast onto an iPod. Um, so that was a big deal for podcasting. And the second thing was, and you can buy TV shows in iTunes, which was a big deal. And right there on stage, 30 feet high was the Lost logo. So I personally feel that uh, most of our listeners accidentally got us trying to find Lost the TV show, but I'll take it, you know? <laughs> hey, free advertisement, right? Well, I, gotta, I, yep. I, I said on the last uh, episode I did that your your podcast was the first one I listened to. And I'm sure you get that a lot from you. Oh, your podcast, but it really was because Jay was start. Uh, we did ours, our first one, it was terrible. Our first episode, and he goes, "No, the, listen to these guys. Listen to these." I go, "Well, I can't do that. I can't be professional. I'm sorry. It's just I can't. I can't stay focused. I can't do this. I can't do that." And so he's, he was getting frustrated because I go, "Look, I go. We got to do our own thing." I go, "I, I, I go. If you want, find somebody else." I go, "I don't care, but I, I can't do it this way because you guys were just because even Ralph said the first one. He goes, "You know, I first started this podcast. I, I listened to Ryan did the transmission. I thought they worked for ABC. They were so good." <laughs> I, I said, well, what did you think when you listen to us? He goes, oh, it's just some guys doing a podcast. <laughs> but it was true. You guys were the, you guys were the, the and I'm not to say this because you're on here, you guys were the example of, of how to do a podcast. Because we, we would get that all the time. You need to be more like the transmission. I go, I can't. Can't do it. Can't. Sorry. Well, it, it takes all different types. And, you know, I've over time evolved to appreciate podcasts like yours. You know, when we started uh, and Jen will tell you, I was very anal retentive. I edited the hell out of every episode. We would record for 90 minutes and I would edit for three hours and the sucker wouldn't go online until four the next morning, you know, versus, versus most podcasts now are just, you get record, you have a conversation and you end it and that's it. No right. fixing, yeah. no post. It's just a natural conversation. Well, and I mean, that takes talent. What I like about the community is there's so many different kinds of shows. There's us and there's you guys and there's even there are even more informal shows and everybody does it a different way, which is what I I kind of like about the community is that everybody's personality is different. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a great <laughs> yeah. But well, I think at the time there was I was trying to remember there was Lost Cast, you guys, us, Delta Park gets lost. I think Delta, Delta Park, Park, yeah, yeah. And, and there there was another one I, I can't I'm sorry, I can't I, I can't remember what it was, but it was like I was like, wow, there's five of those out there. And then when, like a year later, there were 60 and then 100. And then it just went on and on and on and on and on. But it was just just such an amazing show that people just wanted to talk about. And like I said, you couldn't, people couldn't get enough of the uh, water cooler talk, I guess. But, you know, now was a new new way of doing it. But, yeah, I, like I said, you guys were always great. And uh, people always ask me, are they as nice as they seem? I go, yes, they are. They are as nice as they seem. <laughs> we're also as weird as we seem. <laughs> <laughs> we're all weird. I mean, I, I, but yeah, I think that's yeah. what, that's what lost. I think. I think we talked about it before. Maybe I've, I. know I've talked about it before. It made being a geek cool. You know, really. I mean, yeah. when I was growing up, you couldn't be a geek. You couldn't openly say, "Hey, I'm a geek." You know, you had to kind of front it off because you get beat up. I mean, I know times have changed, but uh, now it's like being a geek. You can be a geek. You can geek over a TV show or this or that, and it's, there's no, uh, there's no, you know, pushback on it. 
Yeah, I mean, that that's what Comic-Con, going to Comic-Con taught me is that um, it, it's it, its fun to be into things. Right. Fandoms yeah. in general, yeah, yeah. absolutely. It's a, whole, it's a whole field of study now. I mean, people take it seriously, obviously. It moves markets. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's fantastic. And I still believe that Lost benefited from being right there at the start of social media, you know? And right. like I said, message boards were the thing before, before yeah. this whole Facebook business, before this whole Twitter business. Twitter. Um, and now podcasts about TV shows are not... Are, are the standard almost it's it's a basic category every media company is doing one so it's pretty impressive now lost came at, on twitter at towards the twitter was just getting started how do you think if, if lost it's if twitter was as powerful as it is today and lost was out just coming out do you think how many people there, how many wars would there be on twitter because people got spoiled oh you know spoiler <laughs> spoilers have been a a a near industry for us so I would always be on the pro spoiler side, but I could definitely see it being problematic. Um, but we would do it the same way, which is if you want to know, listen or read this page. But if you don't, right. don't click. You know. Right. Um, but it would be tough to stop other people from having the conversation about it. I'm sure. I mean, I, I even remember uh, when the last Harry Potter or one of the big Harry Potter books was coming out, and one of the most viral videos was people driving by yelling out the biggest spoiler of the book, like literally while people are waiting in line to buy it. So. Uh, yeah. It's always a, those people out there. Yeah, people have not gotten nicer, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. I know but I, gave I, a I one thing that didn't occur to me, one of my first thoughts about the rewatch was that this show is still incredible. Like it's not like you watch, say, uh, an older TV show and you're like, well, that that was cool, but boy, is it quaint today. I mean, it's still a fantastically put together, impactful, uh, engaging television show that I think would still make people have these conversations today. I agree because I started watching uh, doing a Magnum PI rewatch, another Hawaiian show, not not the new show. I actually I do watch the new <laughs> one too, but I was like some of the you like I still like it, I still enjoy it, you know, because I, I I like the characters. But sometimes you go some of the language, like you know, being called a turkey back then was like the worst thing anyone could. Tell. I'm like, God, why was that such a bad thing? And then if they put jive turkey in front of it, then it was even worse. But it's just like <laughs> you you forget how old the show like Magnum PI is because the cars. Yeah, like Pintos driving around in other cars, that, you know, from the '70s and '80s, and you forget that show was in the early '80s, and you know, it's been several years. But yeah, it lost. It, like I said, I've been watching it just glued to the TV, going, "Oh my god, this show is so good, so good!" And even these two episodes, yeah, I'm like, "Yeah," because I had the lot. I just remember the last one I watched was uh, uh, Walk Talk about, about, which is just an amazing episode. But then I go, oh, "How are these going to talk?" But I said the next two. I said. We're excellent. I just, I just, this, I guess season one is just amazing television. So, anyway, do you guys want to get started on the uh, first one, uh, White Rabbit? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, let's talk about that. Now, now what were your thoughts on uh, White Rabbit? Well, this was a Jack episode. Um, um, structurally speaking, I thought there were some really interesting things um, overall about the episode. First of all, they had still not fully committed to the whoosh. You know, like there are oh. still different ways to move from the island to the flashback. Uh, and in many cases, they did the more typical uh, audio from the flashback seeps into the current, into the island scene, and then they cut right, over right. and the audio comes back and then they go over. It was only toward the end where I was like, oh, I think that was a swoosh. It was sort of like a half swoosh. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> they hadn't, they hadn't, uh, they hadn't uh, finalized, I guess. I mean, they might, there might have been swooshes and walkabout and stuff too, but it wasn't consistent. And the other thing that I, just and actually, Jen teared up. Was this is the first appearance this of the, in the show of Life or Death, the the Giacchino, Giacchino theme. Oh yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was like, oh wow, it was this early. Like you know, it was impressive that that musical cue can still have the power it does. <laughs> but we when we first hear it in White Rabbit, it, we didn't know that it was going to become that powerful. I guess. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, the Giacchino music is amazing anyway but yeah go ahead Jen just having lost both of my parents you know within the last few years uh, just hearing that theme again kind of brought me back and it, it really hit me like how universal the themes are of like losing one's parents and having bad relationships with parents and things like that which Jack had well most of them <laughs> yeah. most, well, I think actually, pretty much they all did they all did 
they all had daddy, daddy issues. But I, what I liked about it is I didn't realize it was setting up so many things for the series. You had, you had, you had, um, you, you know, live together, die alone, obviously, but you also had John Locke and Jack talking. You had man of science, man of faith. And so that was, they're kind of bringing that slowly into the, and I think that's what, I keep saying this, but that's what lost the, the writers did so well is they kind of brought it in, they didn't just smack in the face with it. They brought it in slowly and, you, you know, you were able to absorb it and stuff like that. So I, there was just so much stuff that happened in this. I'm like, going, wow, this does play later on. And because people say, oh, they're just making up to go along, but you, they weren't, they, they had a plan. Well, I feel like they were definitely leaving enough loose ends to work with and one of the things that really struck me is that this is like very early in the first season i think that they were still kind of feeling their way around i can see watching this show and all of these characters named characters i'm like how are they going to juggle all of these characters and i remember that first season saying they're probably going to kill off half of them in the first couple of episodes so we only need right. to follow like maybe four of them right um, but no they sustained it all the way through you got to know all of these different characters even ones that uh, are just in the background and don't have a speaking line in in White Rabbit turn out to have speaking and significant roles in the next episode. It was, right. It was pretty impressive. Also, it started with an eyeball. This episode and yes. uh, House of the Rising Sun did the eyeball thing, and I could see them wondering, hey, maybe we'll start every episode with an eyeball, but they didn't I think, do that. I think walkabout, walkabout started with an eyeball. I think it started with Locke's eyeball. If I That's remember possible. correctly, yeah, yeah. I'm trying. I'm trying. Like I said, I'm watching some of these out of order. Right, right. <laughs> um, just to, to try and record these. But I, what I did like is that you got you got Boone, who's a lifeguard, but he's a terrible lifeguard, right? He's he's just he's out there trying to say it was a Joanna. He's Joanna. trying to Joanna, but he he's right. you know Jack has to save him. But I, I I was wondering. I go you know every time I'm on a plane, and I never thought about this watching Lost before. But I, I, every time I'm on a plane, they tell me there's a flotation device underneath the seat. There had to be one or two flotation devices on that plane. Why couldn't they get the flotation device and go out and save Joanna with that with one of those? So they, right? Didn't uh, they, they, that's, that's a fair point. That. That's a fair point. Um, yeah. But <laughs> I'll say this: um, the, the, the thing the thing that occurred to me watching that scene is that uh, it was realistic because. Here in Hawaii, we have millions of tourists, 10, 10 million tourists a year, uh, a significant portion of them, millions of them have never been near an ocean, let alone in an ocean. Right. And the number one cause of death for tourists, although you'll never see this in the brochures, is drowning. Most tons of tourists drown every year, and it's because they're like, oh, I've seen the beach on TV, and you just go out there and you frolic, and life is fun. Beaches are great. And not that it's the biggest single force of nature on the planet and uh, right. could be deadly. <laughs> There's so a lot of things going on. Ocean. Yeah, and they're talking about how hot it is, so I can see going for a swim and losing your life that way. But yeah, Boone, not not uh, representing well as a professional lifeguard. But there are two things that I understand from television that lifeguards need to do, which is save lives and look really good. And I yeah. guess he was hired more for that latter qualification. He was more of a Baywatch lifeguard. Is that what you're trying to say? Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Running on the beach, boom, because he was a good-looking guy. But, you know, we also see Jack's dad um, on the beach. Now, a lot of theories after, you know, later, I mean, at first, you know, you just think he's hallucinating, he's tired, he's, you know, he's not eating properly. Do you think it was Smokey that had taken over Jack's dad? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think later on it, it's established that the smoke monster does manifest himself in different ways. And I think, um, you know, I think Christian was a way for the smoke monster to um, to get Jack into the jungle. Now, do you think? I that, think as a go ahead. Yeah, yeah. No, go ahead. I think as a, as a single episode and as a storyline, I mean, we're just coming off Walkabout. Our minds are blown by the big reveal at the end of Walkabout. Right. You're probably coming to this episode going, "Well, that was pretty impressive," but let's see if you can keep up that kind of storytelling. And here we have in a single episode, we learn why Jack was on that plane, that he was always there to go get his dad back. Oh, his dad actually died. Oh, his body was on the plane and now his body is missing. Like the sequence of reveals and the mind blowing ramifications of it are still are very impressive throughout the entire episode. In terms of it being Smokey, I remember those conversations. My only question is Smokey didn't zombieize bodies otherwise so what happened to christian's actual physical corporeal form i don't know right 
He moved it. I don't know. I, <laughs> you just have to kind of accept it at that point. But I, I, you know, how you say. Also, we find out that because Jack's mom blames Jack for his dad being being in Australia, he says it's your fault. You don't have what it takes. I mean, you keep they keep hitting us over the head that he's not a leader. Jack's not this. But you know, I, we don't find out till what season two or three. What why? I can't re- you know I can't remember when, but we just know that Jack is to, is to blame by his mom and for his dad's disappearance. So almost like the guilt, you know, when he's sitting there thinking about it, he's because uh, Matthew Fox we talked about before is a great crier. He's, right. he's great at showing, he's great at showing most. He's like the perfect perfect guys. Every time you see him, you're like going, you know, he he make, he makes you tear up like you were saying earlier. Yeah. Oh, the thing that struck me about Jack is that Jack is a doctor. And even one of the episodes is called Do No Harm. And that's Jack's whole whole career is built around not doing any harm. And that's like, he does everything. Everything he does is to save lives. And he gets so much he gets so much pushback from people for doing what he thinks he needs to do to do no harm. Like Boone gets in his face for for dragging Boone back to the back to the ocean or back to land. Um, but that's that's what he's supposed to do. He's a doctor, but Boone, despite having his life saved, is not particularly grateful to Jack for having done that. No. I did like the episode, kind of. Still, we're, again, we're with this uh, ensemble. They're they're making part of the storyline. Why is Jack a leader? Why did they decide he's the boss? And he's you know he's not particularly happy with being saddled with that apparent assumed responsibility either. So I thought that was pretty good too. You know, he wants well, to but, be the doctor. He doesn't want to right. be the boss. Yeah, that, and that's what he was doing in the beginning. That he's the marshal, Claire, you know, anyone that needed uh, Rose. Anyone that needed him, that's he was just doing what he does in life. And then people were like saying, okay, well, we need to follow the doctor. And there's there's one scene, another scene with Locke, because Locke tells him he needs to be the leader. And this is what always frustrated me about Locke. I love Locke, the character, but he 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 said, Jack, you need to, you know, they're looking for a leader, they're looking for someone to tell them what to do. But the minute who fought him the most? Locke. Locke right. says, You need to be the leader, but then he didn't go and support Jack most of the time. So he always had them hitting heads and stuff. So that always bugged me about Locke. But now you go to the bigger, grander theories about Locke and his influences on the island, and it could be, it makes perfect sense that he would say, well, Jack is the representation of the uh, force against which I am now operating, so I need to put him in place (laughs) to manifest this grand plan. So, I mean, actually, you mentioned the, the offhand comment, like, it's your fault, you know, I blame you for my dad, your dad being in Australia. Uh, it is actually later this episode, this season, where they explain it. But I remember watching the episode last night or the other night and going, I'm still so engaged in the show that when she drops that line, I'm thinking to myself, I can't wait to figure out what he did. And yeah. I realized, oh, wait, we do know what he did. <laughs> but the storytelling is so compelling that I was sucked back into, ooh, that's a clue. That's a hint. There's more to the story. And uh, they pay that off at least. Well, Jen, you mentioned how Jack always felt he had to save people. Well, they open up with uh, Jack tr- saving his fr- trying to save his friend. He gets be- right. and, of course, and of course, Christian's like you know with his drink in his hand. You know, he's watching Carol Burnett kid just died on his table. He goes and he t- tells Jack, "You don't have what it takes." I mean, it's just again yeah. going going back to daddy issues. Of all the terrible parents on the show, I think Christian's in the top three for sure of the yeah. most terrible parents. He 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 is. I, mean, he, I, I don't think anyone has anyone ever done a list of the worst parents on Lost, because it, it would be a competition. Yeah, there's a good competition. Yeah. Yeah, a, a good it, competition. It, yeah, I think you know there's one on the island. Uh, so yeah, there's. <laughs> <laughs> but it just it just said. I, I think Ed Locke's dad would have to be number one, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean. What he did was actually criminal, so yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I mean, there's a lot of bad ones, but I think I, I go with Locke's dad, number one. But uh, God, that's a great idea. Maybe we should, we should do that for – maybe I'll have you back on. We'll do that oh, as top a uh, top yeah. ten worst dads on Locke's after this is all done. But, yeah, I, I, another thing I want to talk about, because when Jack's chasing after his dad in the, in the jungle, he goes over a cliff and hangs on. Now, Smokey, we find out, couldn't actually kill the candidates. Candidates, you think he was trying to lead him off the cliff to get him to kill? 
if he kills himself, that's, I mean, looking back on theories now, was that oh. what he was doing? Yeah, if he could not take a, that direct action, that's another way to accomplish it. But that completely goes against what I was just saying, that, oh, he was setting up Jack to have that grand uh, conflict, but if he had disposed of him that quickly, then who knows? Yeah. Um, I have to admit, the only thing that really, the main thing that struck me during that scene was uh, they were still kind of working out their special effects budget. Like, the cut from running through the jungle to a big fake cliff was just so jarring to me. I was like, oh, great. Now we're, <laughs> you know, it was not convincing uh, in terms of the setting. You knew when they left the natural jungle uh, setting to do something right. like that. I do want to say very quickly, um, uh, only had a very brief scene, but I thought she acted the hell out of it. You know, the again, just the intensity of the character representations is so great. And that scene where she's basically scared for her husband, angry at Jack, sad, and you know, all of those emotions at the same time, and she conveyed it in her face and in her yeah. voice. I thought, wow, you know, that it's a, it, she just comes in for this one scene, and she was impressive. I think it's Veronica Hamilton. I think she was on Hill Street Blues. Um, I remember that because my mom loved that show. She loved that show. I did too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're just like her mom. Wait a minute. Yeah. 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 I, I was I was a fan of Hill Street Blues. I loved it. Um, I think she, she might have won an Emmy on that show. I, I could be wrong, but that, that show won so many Emmys, it's hard to keep track who did who did what. But then you go, you know, I bring up, you know, trying to okay use a theory that he was trying to kill him, but then he takes him, to, he leads him to the cave. Now, why would he lead him to the water unless he was trying to show him that his his uh, dad's body wasn't there anymore? So was it to give him shelter or to show him, hey, your dad's, I'm trying to drive you crazy. Your dad's body's not here. That's true. Yeah, yeah. It could just have all been a big test, right? Yeah. He is, yeah, he is manipulative that way. Yeah. It worked on Locke, so. Yeah. <laughs> but everyone was waiting to we'll get through Locke. But again, I, I really enjoyed this episode. It sets up so much later on the season. Um Anything else before we move on to House of the Rising Sun? I it occurred to me watching it again um, that they I still think that they were kind of feeling out how much they were going to take advantage of the location. Like so, there's still a lot of tight shots. There's still a lot of generic scenes, like in a hotel room, like uh, you know that you that what I kind of felt was like they were still open to, and I believe this is the case, the possibility that this show would eventually move back to LA. And so the more they committed to Hawaii as a location, the harder it would be to make that change. So I feel like they're filming it right now in kind of a conservative way so that as long as you've got a jungle, uh, everything else is okay. Was, I was really surprised that they didn't, because later in the show, they take so much more advantage of the settings and big, uh, establishing so shots of buildings and uh, structures. And now it's like, just, we're in a hotel room, but this could have been in Kansas for all we know, right? It, we're, we're just telling you we're in Australia, but it doesn't, there's, we've done nothing to make you believe you're in Australia. You're in a morgue in Australia, but it could be a morgue anywhere. There's nothing distinctive about these interior sets. So I thought that was interesting. Well, was it hard? Because a, a lot of times uh, you'll see, uh, they'll be on the street and you, you obviously see what you, you saw firsthand what they were doing to make it look like Hawaii. But it, I, I just couldn't see the show. If they had moved it to LA, I just, I couldn't have seen, I don't think it would work. Oh, well, the lighting you, would be different. Um, yeah. And the force would definitely be different. But, you know, I, 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 anyway, I just thought it was neat that um, it's like, oh, you know, a more could, this more could be anywhere. This, uh, this hotel room could be anywhere. All these interior shots are not um, distinctive. And that's fine. But, just remembering that eventually they're out on a street in Thailand and, you know, they're right. in uh, Baghdad. I'm like, wow, you know, they really went big eventually. Yeah, and I mean, that I, to me, that's like, the, it's it shows how creative they were. Like, they had in mind how to use these places, how to find a place that looks like Iraq and how to find a place that looks like Thailand. I think they this, the set designers uh, were very creative that way. They were able to to find a way to use all these places. Yes, yeah, we when we were in uh, for Sunset on the Beach, we got to take a little, um, Beth took us on a little tour and we got to see where Echo seen the soccer scene and when the, the thugs drive up and you know, they're, they're you know, they're take, they, the, where the priest is everything. I get, and you look, you go, wow, they really, because it does look like Africa when you 
watch it on mm-hmm. TV, and, but you still look around and go, wow, how did they do that? But I guess that's the magic of television. But again, mm-hmm. I, I, I'm glad they, because the, the natural beauty of Hawaii is, is, a, is it's just a great set. I mean, you, how, how can you top that? You wouldn't want to see it on set with fake leaves and all that different stuff. And, well, so I'm glad. It gets more interesting next episode for sure. That conversation. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> so next we have House of the Rising Sun, and we see a gentler, kinder Jen. We don't see Jen on the island. But we see uh, we see uh, uh, Jen. I'm sorry, Jen. Gentler. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm thinking Jen. You're always uh, kinder. Yeah. Gentler, how can you get more kinder and gentler than I Jen? <laughs> <laughs> I even wrote it down. Jen. <laughs> Anyway, he's he's a lot nicer than we see him on the island. In the flashback, we do, but in, on the island, he's not a kinder, gentler Jen. And that actually, in terms of action scenes, was a pretty solid wailing mm-hmm. that uh, he was given Michael. Well, he attacks yeah, you Michael. Know what? You see Jen really wailing on Michael, but later on, Michael's face doesn't look that bad. Well, that's TV. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> We're not going to have uh, hanging um, eyeballs and things. No. Well, you had you had well going back to uh, White Rabbit, young Jack. He looked pretty beat up. His eye was all sw- swollen shut. So yeah, you make a good point there because he was he was wailing on him. He was. But what surprised me about this scene is you have the first two people to try to break it up are Saeed and Sawyer. I, I just shocked me that Sawyer would be the one running to break it up. Well, I, I did. They did. It did go on for a while, and you're thinking somebody should do something. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, why they are the two that step up and go running in there? I'm not sure. And and Vincent wasn't a uh, a, a good dog, I guess. Do you, yeah. What you happened? Think, you think the dog would jump <laughs> what and try to? Dog? But you know, you I can see. Yeah, I can see Saeed breaking up, but that's just out of character. I thought for Sawyer, unless they were trying to show us later on. Well, you know, there's reasons why Sawyer is the way he is. And deep down, he does have a heart, but he doesn't like to show it. But uh, I would, I see him. I go, wow, why would Sawyer break up the fight? Anyway, well, it would have to be someone who could uh, credibly break up a fight. It wouldn't be Claire. It wouldn't be uh, <laughs> Hugo. So maybe they just ran out of options. And that's true because everyone else was on the uh, going out to get water, right? Yeah. Anyway, so we have that, and we also have. Uh, um, Drawing a blank here. Oh, the break up the fight, and then wh- what other things have come to your mind on the uh, for the, well, Jin's, the uh, uh, Jin's eyeball starts the episode. You know, um, I remember the conversation about this episode um, behind the scenes was about you know, boy, there sure is a lot of Korean in this episode. There's a lot of subtitling in this episode. Uh, it's fascinating to me that it was considered risky. Right, I think in the modern day of golden television, there, there's entire shows that you're not watching in your language. There's nothing wrong about that. But right. to put uh, on primetime network television a uh, storyline that is told at least half entirely in another language with subtitles was daring. Um, uh, so that I thought was pretty cool. I also like that you know, it hadn't occurred to me until I watched it again, but they went right into well, where I come from. Koreans and uh, African Americans don't get along. You know, it's like, oh yeah, that that's a that's a thing. You know, that that yeah. was addressed in the show. So, uh, I definitely think you know the diversity and the and the use of the Korean language was was very impressive for early on in a show where you're still trying to figure out what it's about. Did did we know um, Saeed's background before this episode? Did no. he mention before he was from Iraq? I don't think we've gotten to Saeed's backstory yet. Because he, he, yeah. he did say he told he, mentioned he was from Iraq. Yeah. He told Hurley he he was he was. Uh, oh, okay. So, but I don't know if he was public. I don't think it was widespread known that he was uh, from Iraq. But uh, but we don't know his background as a torturer. So that that comes on <laughs> later on. But uh, um, what I what I liked about is how it shows you know. Jin is 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 so nice. He's loving. He's you know he's 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 uh, was a waiter, and you know son obviously has a dad who she doesn't like. She has daddy issues with her dad, and to marry Jin, I'm mean, a son. He has to work with the dad, and you can see how working for the dad just changes Jin from this happy, loving guy to just an angry, bitter person, and that maybe that's why son didn't want him, you know, working for his dad, her dad. 
Well, one of my questions was, you know, how much did uh, Sun know about her dad's business, right? Because it does seem that she's reluctant for him to go to work for him, but not in right. the way that it turned out to actually be. Like, it's at first it seemed like, oh, I don't want you to work for my dad because that makes you indebted or, you know, that's just uncool. Yeah. But uh, was she ignorant of the violence of her dad's business until he comes home covered in blood? Yeah, or, you know? I, I always, I got the feeling that when she expressed reluctance for him to go to work for her dad, it was more that she thought her dad was just a difficult person because um, she seemed genuinely shocked that he came home covered in blood. Yeah. Um, yeah. What I do like about that backstory too is that there's a mix of son being not okay with her new life, right? Where she doesn't like that she doesn't see Jin anymore. She doesn't like um, various aspects of it, but she still she still comes home shopping with bags full of stuff. She still right. goes ahead and you know has a nice place to live and gets it redecorated and things like that. So she's not you know faultless it's in like, enjoying the it's lifestyle. Like that movie Goodfellas, where the women turn a blind eye to what their men do and they. There's like a whole segment in that movie about how the women just go ahead and spend the money and shop and make the most of their financial situation and kind of ignore the less savory aspects of what their husbands do. That's a good point. That, that is a good analogy because they get their hair done and, you know, puffed up and stuff like that. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, maybe she was I, – I, I, I tend to think that she did know that there was more to her dad than what – because we don't, we obviously don't know what's going until Jin comes in covered with blood. We're like, okay, this is some kind. He's doing something illegal, or, you know, something that's not, you know, a uh, honored profession. But, uh, but maybe she was more shocked that that Jin went that far, that he did cross yeah. that line, that he's doing things that she never expected him to do at all. Because that that's probably why she feels she has to leave. She she has to leave her dad, and she know, and w when she's talking to the the deck, the uh, interior designer, but it turns out to be someone trying to get her, you know, a new life. She, uh, the person, you, you know, you, we have to, the, the dad has to think you're dead. Everyone has to think you're dead for in order to work because the dad had so much power. So she was obviously afraid of her dad, I think in a way that, so I, I guess we'll never know for sure, but I, I lean towards the fact that she did know who her, her dad mm -hmm. was. Maybe not all of it, but she, she had a good idea of what, the dad was capable of doing anyway. Well, it certainly even it works that if she did know um, that being surprised how far her husband had fallen into that racket and right. eventually deciding that's why this marriage is untenable. Uh, but uh, but yeah, definitely. Um, I liked that backstory. It was good to see the Byodoin temple in Kaneohe. Uh, yeah. Although I guess we're supposed to leave, believe that her dad lives at a temple. I don't know that they were, <laughs> what they were trying to say. Um, but uh, but yeah, that you know, it, it's a good Korea back backdrop. So that was. Nice. I've I've seen that temple a couple of times on my Magnum PI rewatch. Yep, yep. It's oh, a, they're using it there. It's a oh. popular set. Although I'm watching it, going, where are all the feral cats and chickens and peacocks? <laughs> and peacocks. <laughs> we have a lot of those going. You had to clear that, that property, I guess. Yeah, I guess. But uh, then you also have the other story going on. You have Charlie, you know, and you have Charlie, Kate, and uh, Locke, and Jack. They're going, you know, they they go to get the water and stuff like that. And they find Adam and Eve, and and Jack finds the black rock and the white rock. So that that's leading to more. I mean, they just these writers did such a great job of of blowing our minds away. You know, just going, well, what? Why are they there? And the only thing people always came back said, well, Jack said that it was like fifty years. But you know, you can go. He was not an expert on that. But so, what did you think about the Adam and Eve reveal and that they were there and the rocks and stuff? Well, I like that, again, I feel that this early in the show, they were leaving loose ends on purpose, knowing that they needed to have something to come back to later. It seemed like a very practical decision. Yeah. I think that uh, what Adam and Eve eventually turned out to be significant portions of the mythological debates about the arc of the entire show, and I think that what stood out to me about discovering them and giving them a date range was that uh, later we should be less surprised that, oh, now they're jumping back to the 50s and now they're jumping back to ancient history, right. you know, that, uh, that the time scale of the story that this island is involved in has always been 
grander than just a few years, you know, that it's always been um, something bigger than that. But black and white rocks, that's about as explicit as you can get about a contrast or a combat or a battle. So uh, I just thought it was it was smart. Yeah, and like um, the use of others this early on when she describes the, the other uh, people, the other survivors as others. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the it just it, it gradually pulls back throughout the series like they consider the other passengers others while there's other people on the island and um yeah there's there's always a group of others well narratively this episode is important because we're this is where you start to separate our group you know right. there's the i have hope and i'm going to stay on the beach and there's the we need to just get settled in we're going to be here for a while so let's set up in a cave i think that uh that kind of political setup was telling and continues throughout the rest of the show. I remember the scene where basically Sawyer is asking uh, Kate, you know, which side are you on? Which way are you voting? It almost seemed like right. a referendum happening on the beach to decide: are you a cave person or a beach person? Right. So, exactly. You know, I, I thought that I thought that was really good um, because you are watching the show, saying what can they do and watching this episode, you're like, oh, maybe the two factions separate and then they eventually try to kill each other off. Like, where is this show going? I can't figure out, you know, what the overall plan is. Now they're separating the gangs. So what does that mean? Are we going to, is this where they call the herd so we only have to worry about four characters? <laughs> or, you know, what's the long-term plan here? But they also had a scene where Charlie, and it shows where, because for most of, of Lost, they, they're not honest with each other. Like if they find out information, well, you're, you're on a need to know basis. Yeah, so, I guess Locke doesn't know there was a transmission from a French woman. And transmission, I'm assuming that's where you got you got the name for the podcast. Yes. Because okay. <laughs> every time I heard I go, that's where they got the name for the pod. Good job. But anyway, I said, uh, I because he says something, oh, they're, so they're about there being others on the island. And Locke says, well, and Kate kind of goes, oh, you know, these, and, and Locke goes, of course there's other people that were on the island. So... Uh, just that secretive stuff that even happens later, you know, three in season. It's like, can you just communicate with people? It is, yeah. But I guess, I guess it's good storytelling. But well, they have that conversation. Like, we can't tell them about this. You know, right. it'll, it'll, it'll it'll remove their hope or something. Like but that. that happens in everyday life. You know, you get into a situation and you think to yourself, "This would have been so much easier if we had just talked to each other." That's right. That's just. I think that's just real life. Really. Yeah, that's true. This episode uh, also gets into the shipping part of Lost most explicitly. I'm not sure if the previous episodes went as far as basically Hurley saying, so what's going on? And Jack going, are we in high school? And yeah. uh, Sawyer, so here, I have this question. It didn't occur to me. Sawyer says in this episode to Kate, like, oh, you're in a love triangle. And so is he saying the love triangle is Kate, Jack, and Saeed? Yes. This is the third point in what? Okay. That yeah, I didn't pick up on that at all. Well, because in the beginning, he's Kate does kind of flirt with Saeed also. Mm -hmm. Or uses her charm, I should say. She's you I know, guess. she's helpful. But she seems to be hanging around and it could be Sawyer's just way of being jealous and you know, what about me? What about me? You know, but but I, I, I thought in the beginning that that she could have hooked up with uh Saeed also. Sure, sure. Well, uh the Recontextualizing of the show also is interesting because was it about a month ago that Evangeline Lilly revealed about being uncomfortable about having to undress on the show and you know be a sex object on the show yeah. and you know you have the let's all run away from the bees and take off our shirt scene and I was like oh this is probably on right. that list of scenes that she did not like doing I agree that. Her character early on in the show seemed like it could be much more substantive, substantive than it turned out to be. So this, you know, for Evangeline Lilly, I agree. You know, being a love triangle point was less interesting than a lot of the other things that other characters were able to do. Even though some people did love that, I mean, they they they, they, that they is did. Because oh, yeah. I Jane. never used. That. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny as you mentioned Jade on the last podcast I did. I said when I was talking about. Jack and Kate. I said, Jate. I go, oh, I can't believe I said that. But, you know, because I don't think I ever said it. I, I never used the the terms chipper that they, term. chipper terms. <laughs> I just never did it because I, I 
I not want to say I didn't care. There was a couple couples I wanted to get together, but it wasn't my main focus of of loss was to have who's who was going to marry who, who was going to be with who. I didn't, you know, really care. I mean, you you love that eventually that you know Rose and Bernard do get back together. I mean, there, there's there's scenes that you do love, but it just wasn't a big deal for me. But I know a lot of people that was their. You know, I'm not. They did love that part. That was what a lot of why a lot of people watched it. They they cared about that that part of the show, but not, it wasn't for me. And you know, they did enough of uh, the mysteries of the show this episode too. I mean, I think the balance was good. I think uh, Terry O'Quinn is really showing his chops. Not that Walkabout didn't, but you know, his interactions with Charlie kind of gives him that, uh, you know, Buddhist kind of knowing calm that. Uh, Kind of gets shaken later, but it was kind of impressive. I, you know, he knows what he knows what uh, Charlie's looking for. Finds yeah. his guitar in a magical moment. It it helps him to be somebody's guide for once in his life. Like he's never. I don't. That's not a role I think he's ever played. You know, somebody who's able to guide somebody because I think Locke was kind of a pretty pathetic character before. You know, at, right. with what happened with his father and uh, just a lot of things that went on in his life. And now he's able to be somebody's mentor. And right. His relationship with Charlie is a way to em embrace that, be somebody's mentor. And that's what I, you, you go back to Locke. He was so, he, he was like, he was so useful. He was, he, he was, he could have been not, maybe not, he, he didn't have the chops to be the leaders. So we see that in the flashback. So I, I, that's what's so great about the flashbacks, but he could have been, you know, he knew how to get food. He knew how to get water. He he was he was helping Charlie get off heroin. He knew how to, you know, he didn't approach it like it's your choice. He just said you have to do it. He goes, you know, you're gonna this is gonna run out. You're gonna go through withdrawals. And so you know he he works. He he was so positive in a lot of his stuff in the beginning. Whereas later on, he, again, he's trying to do what the island's telling him to do, and he gets disruptive. So that's 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 again, the show doesn't work without him doing that. Mm -hmm. There's times like a lot. What do you do that lock? But you know, it just it kind of irritates me from time to time. <laughs> yeah. Then we also we also find out that Sun speaks English. Yep, pretty good. Um, I think Michael does a good job of being as surprised as as we would be. Uh, yeah. I think that that whole you know conflict over the watch was. Well, a little more overblown than it would needed to have been, but um, dramatically, it, <laughs> dramatically it worked. Uh, interestingly, that the watch didn't play into the actual flashback. It's just right. another artifact at this point that is important. But uh, you know, Jin speaking English, and I think they they do they continue that charade for longer, or does it just come out in the next episode? I can't even remember. I I don't remember. Because yeah. I know when yeah. when Jin when Jin finds out he's upset, right? So uh, and then that also starts the handcuff with where Jin has the handcuff on to like I think a few episodes into season two. It's like I remember, it, can they just get that handcuff off him? It's it's got to be it's ridiculous. Find find something to get it off. But uh, um, I like the story was just carrying the handcuffs around. Like oh, uh, we just broke up a beach fight. You know those handcuffs? They're in your back pocket. Can you throw them to me? Like okay. <laughs> <laughs> kind of have to overlook some things, right? Is that what you're saying? Right, right. And there was a, the, I, the scene, I, I think one of the best scenes in the episode is when the son is debating whether she should leave or not. And she's yep. going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and she's tearing that, up. That scene is so visceral. Like, because you can, I, you, you can feel the, the, the pressure she's under. You can, you can feel just the, the tension inside of her. She just plays that so well. All in her face. Yeah. She's trying to be nonchalant face. standing yeah. right. next to the airline counter, but she's having this life or death conflict in her head. Uh, and uh, of course, when they escalate through new clothes to a diamond ring for him to pull out the cute little flowers from long ago, you know, yeah. you knew that that was it. That was it for her. I said, what a great scene. Because you had the scene where Jack was talking to, you know, the, 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 the uh, person at the airlines trying to get his dad on the plane. And, you know, it just, it just such was a, but that scene I think was probably the, my favorite scene of the episode where Jen just he gets a little s smile and shows up the flower and she just goes, Oh, I guess I have to stay now. And it's just, it just, it just wrapped up. It just wrapped up the episode perfectly for me. 
Uh, but I did want to say something at the end. They have the song. I can't remember what the song was playing, but it says something. It goes something to the fact uh, you you caused pain and suffering. And when they do that, they're showing Saeed. When there was, it's something about show, about pain and suffering, so are they telling us oh. that this guy is a torturer, that he tortured that's people? That's 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 a good point. Yeah, we I hadn't uh, lined up the lyrics with the people they were cutting to. That's very likely. I mean, I do feel that throughout these two episodes and every episode leading up to it, you get little hints that uh, there's more to the story. Like somebody asks Kate. Or Jack asked Kate, how did you end up like this? Why are you this way? And she right. has this look on her face like, wait for my flashback. So, uh, <laughs> But she also, said, she also said later on, she goes, you had your chance to. Uh, but get the story. Yeah. yeah, I think it was important um, you had your chance. Uh, Hurley using the disc man to play a song out of an episode, also I can tell was something they were thinking, oh, maybe this could become a thing, and they right. do do it in another episode. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly they did accommodate the, the question at the time, which is how long are those batteries gonna last? So. Right. <laughs> it's a magic <laughs> but, uh, it forever. But right. actually, you know, I'm glad they did it, because I think that the musical uh, montage at the end of an episode, episode where we pass over everyone's thoughts full, thoughts full faces is a cliche in television at this point. Yeah. So I'm glad they didn't, they didn't stick with that in particular. Yeah, because uh, I know my wife's a huge Grey's Anatomy fan, and they, they do it. It's, is it every episode? They, they do it. It's like, yeah, whatever. But I'm, I'm with you. I, I'm glad they didn't keep that as a uh, gimmick type thing. And, but overall, I mean, I, I love both episodes. I thought, I thought they were very good. I thought that focusing on the Asian characters was uh, great. That was um, a good choice. You know, yeah. I mean, even back then, I was myself sensitive to portrayals of Asians, and I remember the fear of uh, Jin's character not not redeeming himself and turning out to just be a complete asshole. <laughs> and, uh, so I'm glad that you know that that, that they show that depth that, that that these characters have more going on in their internal lives. Um, uh, can we talk a little bit about locations? Sure. Yeah, so of course they're on the beach and they need to go somewhere else and they say we're gonna separate and go to the caves. Right. Um, but uh, we knew in Hawaii that those caves were in a building on Nimitz Highway in the industrial area of town. You know, so already, oh, so they're not uh, you mentioned caves. earlier, Oh, no. Oh, <laughs> so man. already what you mentioned in the last season, or in the last episode we just talked about, like, oh, they're not going to put up the fake ferns and we're in a cave, yada, yada. We can do this in Los Angeles. That's actually what they did. I thought, oh, uh, they set up this cave set, and if they eventually kill off everyone on the beach, then they don't need to film anywhere expensive, like on a beach. <laughs> they can just build a cave set, and it becomes Cave Town TV or something like mm -hmm. that. So, uh, you think that, that was, was, done, a, was that done to keep the cost down? I think, yeah, they're being still trying to be conservative. They blew 10 million on the pilot, so that's right, that's probably right. a chunk out of their budget. So, yeah, let's move, let's move indoors. Let's have air conditioning. Let's have a protected set where Walker uh, random nerds can't watch what we're doing. And it right. seemed like a very, <laughs> it seemed like a very uh, practical consideration. Although the location where they chose to build that set was actually an infamous building in Hawaii history. It was the location of the only mass shooting we've had. Uh, and nobody occupied that space for years and years and years really? before Lost Move. Yeah. Didn't yeah. know that. So I'm glad they moved back out. People say that building is haunted. So. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I want to be in there, but... Um, but so we're draw, uh, it, it's going back to the cave and the one more thought about it. What, what would you have done? Because I can see both sides. If you're not on the beach, if a plane comes by, they're not going to see you. But the cave is the best place for survival. Well, if you're in the cave and you know that there are other people on the beach, then you still stand a pretty good chance of being you get rescued. the best of both worlds. Yeah, you get the best. You, you still get shade and water and food, um, and it's nice and presumably nice and cool in there. Yeah, I like Sawyer saying it's going to rain eventually. I'm an optimist, you know. Like uh, <laughs> that works. That's true. That's a true statement. These, these this jungle is very green, so it's not going to be this beautiful blue and sunny all the time. But the other thing that they don't think in terms of shelter is when <laughs> if they make it to monsoon season or 
hurricane season or wherever right, yeah. this island happens to be, that's going to be a problem too. Um, I would probably be a cave person because I don't like getting sunburned. And I'm still surprised how nobody is seriously sunburned on this show, especially Kate. Yeah. Well, they have that sunscreen that uh, Sawyer's peddling for $5,000. That's right? true. That's yeah. true. Yeah. yeah. Could, <laughs> how about you? Here, cave or beach? I probably would have loved the beach, but I, I got to have uh, some kind of shelter. I mean, I, but here's my going back to them not, shouldn't Jack's approach have been, we'll leave two or three people here on the beach? To keep the fire going, we'll rotate, you know, so we keep the file signal file go, fire going, and all that, and then the rest of us live at the cave. But yeah, as if you're gonna, it, it seems that you could just have a scout. You could rotate that person, like right. you're sleeping on the beach this tonight. You're yeah. sleeping on the beach tomorrow night. Um, so you're right. It does. It defies logical thinking, which is why I think that it was sort of like. I was wondering, oh, this is how we're going to call the herd. This is how we're going to reduce the ensemble cast. And I'm like, right. so let's see, who ended up on the beach? Who ended up in the caves? If they kill off everybody in the caves, then, oh, well, then aren't we supposed to be following Jack? But they can't kill off people on the beach because Sawyer's definitely a star in the show. Like, I couldn't figure out which way they were going to go. Well, that was what's brilliant. They did leave, you know, they left Kate and Sawyer. Uh, Mike, no, Michael went to the cave, right? But they left main characters. Yeah. So Michael stayed up. Michael stayed. He said, "I have to get my my son off this island, so he's on right. the beach." Oh, he's my on boy, the beach. my boy, <laughs> Walt. But then they also Said stayed behind too, so they had the characters that we for the first six episodes have gotten to know. They they did split them up, so yeah, that was yeah. it. Wasn't like I think you you probably would have been right if they would have left like the log carrying people behind and <laughs> no. The you know, the red shirts, if they would have left them behind and everybody else went to the cave and, oh, what happened to them? Oh, they died. They, something like that. But, uh, that was uh, another brilliant move by Lost. But uh, anything else you guys want to talk about? Oh, uh, yeah. Something did occur to me. Um, another theme that comes up is I did it for us. Like um, Jin says that uh, I'm, I'm for, I am working for your father for us. And then later on, Nikki and Paolo, <laughs> Paolo uh, she says to him, I'm with this sleazy TV producer for us. Oh, I did, and yeah, you're right. that, that happens a little bit more than just those two. Um, yeah, I'm times. taking one I'm taking one for the team, basically. Yeah. yeah definitely. Yeah. And that would show how Jen became so bitter that he was doing yeah. it. Yeah. You know, he was just. But He's they, doing it for, yeah. But there's no way they could have been married, right? If he didn't get the father's approval, right, right. So well, I mean, and they could live together in secret, like they could have run away, just like well, that's what son, son wanted, but he but he wanted it to be official. So yeah. right. I do like that in this episode, they just are sort of there's that one sentence in that hushed conversation with the fake interior decorator where she goes, "Did you take your lessons?" and she says yes, and then. Later on in the show, we get an entire episode that explains that one sentence. So that was pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I didn't even think about that. That's a good point. But yeah, I, I enjoyed both episodes and can't wait to get to the next two. But uh, yeah, I just, uh, I, we love Lost and we keep talking about it all these years later. And thanks to you because we have actually haven't taken the time to sit down and rewatch. 10 years later, you know, uh, 16 years after it started. So this was really good because, again, I forgot how good it is. It's not like uh, watching uh, The Wire and thinking, this is a great show, but it's a little dated, or uh, uh, what's the prison show that I can't get into? Oz. Oz, Oz. where it's like, I, I can imagine that this was cutting-edge TV at the time, but now it's just ridiculous, right? But Lost stands up. Lost is still great. And in fact, our daughter came into our room while we were watching it, and she got sucked in, and then she said, oh, can I be on the podcast? And I said, well, you got to watch the show. <laughs> and actually, she, I think now that she's an adult, I mean, she was, what, six, right? Now that she's an adult and she's really a big deal, big fan of good TV, like she's watching uh, The West Wing over and over again, that she might give it a shot. She might say, oh, okay, I'll, this lost thing wasn't just this ridiculous fantasy island. You know, there's there's some good stories here. So I just love that uh, that it still holds up, and I appreciate you giving us the opportunity to take another look at it. No, I'm just happy. I, I love talking to you guys. So it was, it's because you get, you, it just, you guys are amazing. So, and I'm not just saying that you're on this show, but you guys are just amazing. You're a big part of the lost community. So, well, and we admire what, you and uh, Jack and Colleen and, you know, 
uh, J, you and J. <laughs> uh, it happened. You want to tell the story again about uh, meeting the producers of the Lost? Oh yeah, so there was uh, an event with the with the symphony. They were doing the score, uh, and uh, Carlton was there. Um, so Ryan, he turns to me, and he you know he sees Carlton by himself in the corner somewhere, and he says to me, "Which one is that?" And I say, "It's Carlton," and I'm chanting at him, Carlton. And he says, "Hi, Damon." Yeah, that was not good. <laughs> I can't. I can't keep those things. I can't keep that. That. That straight. It happens. It happens. I know. Uh, uh, Colleen and I were. Uh, they were doing a lost. Uh, it's where they showed the clip of uh, Man in Black and Jacob doing the the funny thing where they did how the you know how the ending of lot they were poking fun at it, and it was a lost thing. And and this guy came to us and said, "Hey, can you make sure nobody sits here?" Sits here. Uh -huh. and some guy, some guy came in a, uh, some guy came in a costume. And I said, "Hey, hey, you can't sit here." He, we're, both Colin and are hitting him on the day. You can't sit here. You can't sit here. You know, he's ignoring us. And so, turned out to be Carlton. He was in the costume. <laughs> <laughs> I go, oh, yeah. Anyway, but now again, thank you. Thank, thanks for joining us. I really appreciate it. And uh, you know, anytime else you want to come on here and talk about your favorite episodes or maybe your least favorite episodes, we can do that also. So I know there's one down the road. Well, don't get me started on uh, Nikki and Paulo, baby. <laughs> that 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 debate could break up this marriage. So just be very very. Well, that might be fun. A little Jerry Springer action on the uh, po podcast. <laughs> Throw a chair. Anyway. That'd be great. So anyway, you guys, do what? Maybe I'll come on with Kate. There like a go. mother daughter kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, that would be good. Any again, open invitation. Anytime you want to send me a. So we're doing this for two episodes a week until it's over. Only 117 more to go, dude. Yeah, it's it's it's. Uh, but so far, I'm enjoying it. It's fun. It's because when I yeah. first start, when I first actually someone sent me said, "Why don't you do a lost read?" And I talked to Jay, and Jay just says, "You know, he's he's busy. He's got a new job. He's got two young kids." And like you were saying in the beginning, mm -hmm. and I go, "All right, fine. I'll, I'll just I'll just if anytime you want to join me, you can join me." And he's been out of town a lot, so. Uh, I said, all right, I'll do it. I, said, I almost, I was telling my wife, I go, do I want to watch Lost again? Do I want to get where I have to talk about it and all this? Because I wanted to watch it just for me. I wanted to watch it just where I could watch it and just keep, if I wanted to move to the next episode, could move to the next episode. But uh, I'm enjoying this because I'm getting different perspective. You know, you, it's almost like the old podcast, Dave, where you put in the podcast, oh, I'm going to listen to Transmission. I'm going to listen to Dharma Lars and all the different stuff. It's just, it's been fun so far, but of course I'm only in. It's only the third week, so it could get. When I get, <laughs> when I, when I get to season three with Nicky and Paolo, maybe I'll regret the decision. But but as of now, hey, I'll come on that episode. All right, then, then I'm, I'm pinching <laughs> you right now. <laughs> I'll wear my razzle dazzle shoes. You just wait. <laughs> Ryan for Nikki and Paolo. Got it. <laughs> All right, guys. That's razzle, dazzle. razzle dazzle. All right. <laughs> All right. Bye, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>